Hello, this is Clint Halstead, and this is an internet course called Introduction to Microprocessors. Uh, this is a continuation of a course, an online course uh, I did on the PIC 16 microprocessors. Um, I did a YouTube series. You can see I did all the way up to Unit 38 on starting with an 8 bit PIC 16 microprocessor. And um, I finished that lesson and we learned about how to do the assembly language programming. We learned about um, many of the different peripherals inside of the PIC microcontrollers. And now we're going to move on to uh, a new type of programming language called C. And the, the C programming language for the microchip processors really the first chip that's really optimized for C is the the next step up above the 16 is the 18 so the PIC 18 microprocessor is what we're going to start off with so <coughs> so let's look uh, let's really look really quickly at uh, just an example chip that we can start off with so the PIC 18F242 or the 2420. Now there's a 242 and there's a 2420. The 0 is an updated version of the 242. I actually have the 242 chips that I bought for my students, but the 2420 is even better. But depending on what you have, make sure that you have the correct data sheet um, because they are different chips. But you can see that we have. Um, for this particular chip, we have a port B, we have a port A, we have 8 bits for port A and 8 bits for port B, and we also have a port C as well. So uh, it has a lot more peripherals on it. Um, you can see it has a timers, double E problem comparators, a CCP, which is a PWM chip. UARTs, a 10-bit ADC, so it has a lot, a lot of uh, peripherals inside of it. A 8 megahertz oscillator, and has a lot more memory uh, than we were dealing with with the PIC 16F84A, which was the first chip that we worked with in the first lessons. So this is going to be lesson one of, of what I'm going to call the PIC 18 series of microprocessors. <clears throat> and also with the PIC 18, you get an increased instruction set, and, uh, and that increased instruction set is what is useful for the C programming language. Notice that you get uh, move instructions, you get multiply, uh, you get all these different compare instructions. Um, you, you get a 16-bit instruction word instead of 12, so that's where you get the added functionality is in the size of the instruction word. Um, you get more branching statements. You have you know, if not carry, if not negative, if not overflow, so it, all these different options. Um, <clears throat> and then more options here. And so you, you'll have to go through these, maybe pause the, the lesson and, and look at those or, or go to an internet site and at microchips website you can find all these instructions so you can know what all the assembler now these are the same the assembler language instructions but with C we can write in a, a higher level language and easier to understand language without having to memorize all these mnemonics so that's the advantage of, of doing an, a C type program whereas an assembler um, we as the human here, we have to think, okay, what type of language does the microprocessor want? Well, it wants machine code. It wants zeros and ones. Um, so we, assembler is closely related to the machine code, but the higher level language is something like C programming language is, is much farther removed from the actual zeros and ones of the machine code or the mnemonics having to do with the assembler. So these high-level languages are, are words that humans understand better 
are easier for us to think in, but it's it's farther removed and farther disconnected from the microprocessor itself. A little bit of history on C. It was developed in the 1970s at Bell Labs, New Jersey, United States. In 1989, a version of C was adopt, adopted by the by ANSI, American National Standards Institute, and then it was adopted in 1990 by the uh, International Organization for Standards. So this is when it really started becoming more popular in the 90s. <coughs> There's amendments, the 1995 and 1999. The 1999 version contains extensions which are not implemented in many compilers. So that's something that's important to know. Now as the first example, it's traditional to give an example program for uh, you know your C programming language so this is our example program that's used in the book um, and if I didn't mention already which I probably need to go back and mention really quickly we're using the following book and design embedded systems with pick microcontrollers and this is the book Tim Wilmshire so I, I really highly recommend that you buy the book and go through the book it's a very very good tool to use it's a very good thing to have when you're programming and it's, it's very affordable in my opinion <clears throat> so the first example that's in the book is uh, it, it counts out to some LEDs which we designed some hardware in some of the previous lessons and we learned how to do that with Eagle CAD so you can go through the previous lessons and learn how to design your own hardware but what this program does is it it basically initializes it, an unsigned character it starts a new function void main void initializes a tris B which sets the outputs uh, sets the port B as outputs uh, initializes a counter to value of one and then it goes into an infinite loop a while loop a while one means that this is always going to be executed because one is true always going to be true port B equals counter so it sets the it outputs the value on the counter to port B and then it increments the counter and then it loops forever and so it continuously so basically what what you really need in here is you're going to need a delay if you're really going to see these values which we can add later but for now for simulation purposes this would simulate just fine and we would be able to see this we could add a breakpoint and all that if you wanted to have an example of this code with um, some things that I added to it to make it work better for example, I have um, the watchdog timer disabled and things like that in the code. Then you can go to this website, to my Dropbox website. This is a DL, not a, a 1. This is not a 1, it's an L, actually. Um, actually, I think I, I need to make sure that... Yeah, that's an L. It's, it's, it's really hard to tell that that's an L. Sorry about that. But it is an L. <laughs> it looks like a one. But um, so you can copy this. So it's DL HTTPS. Don't forget about the S. Colon forward slash forward slash DL dot Dropbox dot com forward slash U forward slash five nine seven two eight five six three forward slash example underscore fourteen P one dot C. If you type that into a web browser, then you will be able to see uh, the file, and you can copy and paste this into your own code, and you can simulate this with MPLAB X. <coughs> so let's talk about the program, the example program. Everything that we talk about now is going to be based on this very simple uh, example program. And I did forget to mention that there is a, a preprocessor directive here called the include statement, which includes the chip header into the program. So the first thing is laying out the program. C is a, a so-called free-form programming language, which means it does not conform to a strict layout. Similar, if you think about the assembler language, you had to have uh, to have a label, you had to have uh, your label in column, the very first column. Uh, otherwise, it would not be defined as a label. Well, we don't have to worry about that 
uh, with C. Okay, so it doesn't really matter the position of things. So C programs are made up of three simple, well, four simple things. Declarations, which set the scene and initialize things. Statements, where the programming action takes place. Comments, which provide a commentary to the human reader on what's going on. And space, which provides essential gaps between words. So much of the program is actually space, but that helps make it easier for humans to read. So laying out the program, the comments are made by a forward slash and star, and then you put your comment in the middle, and then you end with a star and then a forward slash. Anything inside of here will be ignored. An alternate way would be to use a double slash. So two forward slashes, and then anything after that would be ignored by the, the compiler. That's just a comment. Next thing we talk about is declarations. The De declarations are used in a number of ways to create program elements like variables and functions and to indicate their properties. It's important as all variables and functions in, in C must be declared before they can be applied. So we can't declare, we can't use something unless it's declared unless it's inside of the header. And uh, just to give you an example, here we had to declare counter and then we use counter but also you'll notice that we also use tris b well we didn't never declared it well that's because it's inside of the header okay so the tris b is going to be declared inside of this header which is just another part of code that's added to this code so when the similar sees this it takes this file it goes and looks for it it knows where it's at already um, and then it adds it all the like like you had already typed it or someone had already typed it out so that's the way that works so a declaration is terminated by a semicolon in the example program we had the declaration of unsigned character counter and then we had to terminate that with a semicolon and then we had a comment so this part of the code is is ignored this is the comment and then this is the declaration and then this is how you terminate that declaration <clears throat> in simple programs declarations tend to appear as one of the first things in the program but they can also occur within the, the program as well statements Statements are where the action of the program takes place. They perform mathematical or logical operations and establish program flow. Each statement, which is not a block, ends with a semicolon. There are a number of different categories of statements. The most common is the expression statement, which includes mathematical manipulations. Some expression statements from program example 14.1 are the trist b equals zero, this is, initializes the port b, ends in a semicolon, and counter equals one, that's an expression, and it, it ends with a semicolon. Statements are executed in the sequence they appear in the program, except where program branches take place, so they're executed in order that they're written. Code blocks. Decla declarations and statements can be grouped together into blocks. A block is contained within bra braces. That's these things. These are braces. Example block from the example 14.1 is shown below. So this was the main body of the program, the while statement 1. 1 just means true. A 0 means false. So the way the while works is if if whatever's in, inside the parentheses is true, then it's going to be executed. So you could have a variable is equal to something, and if that's true, then it'll be executed. In this case, if you put a 1 here, uh, that's always going to be executed. It's just continuously going to loop in sequence, uh, like, I, like shown on the screen. So this, this is called a block. 
Blocks can be written within other blocks, so you can have, this is called nesting. If you have one block inside of another block, it's called nesting. Keeping track of these pair of braces is important. Numerous ones can be nested together. Usually we want to line up these, uh, block, these braces, these brackets, so that they're uh, right below and above each other. <coughs> and nested pairs should be indented deeper into the page. So if you had a nested loop, then you would indent it with a tab or a couple of spaces. Space. It's good to use a bunch of space in your program because it improves clarity. Um, space is required sometimes to separate words, which otherwise would merge into one. However, further space, including blank lines, is ignored by the compiler. For example, the program would compile the same if it were written. So the example would compile the same if it were written while one uh, brace port B equals counter, semicolon, and then you got your comment, counter equals counter plus one, semicolon, in brace, and then another comment. So this, this would execute the same as this. So they're, they're equivalent. Except this is easier to read. So having the space is preferred, preferred method. There are certain words in C programming that you cannot use for variables and things like that. For example, we use counter as a variable. That's fine a name, but you can't use words like break, double, go to, return, because those are used as reserved words. Those mean something to the compiler, so you cannot use those as variables. Uh, however, you can use these inside your comments as long as it's you have the forward slashes and you're, you create the comment properly. <coughs> functions. C programs are structured from functions. Every program must have at least one function called main. Program execution starts with this function and the program is contained within it. Apart from the main function, functions are in some way similar to similar subroutines. Any function may call another. Data elements called arguments can be passed to a function. However, they must be of a type which is declared in advance. And only one return variable is allowed whose data type must be declared. The terminology parameter is often used in place of argument. So when we use these words parameter and argument, we may use them uh, to mean the same thing. So a function is defined in a program by a block of code having particular characteristics. Its first line forms the function header. The function header from the example program shown here illustrates the general format. Notice that we have the return type. This is the type that the function is going to return. In this case, void means nothing. We're not going to return anything. The function name is main and the argument that we're going to pass it in this case is nothing. We're not going to pass anything to it. Now this is standard for the, the, the very main uh, function of the program. Every C program has to have void main void. You have to have it. And then the rest of the program here. Now any other subroutines or sub functions inside of there, you can name them whatever you want. You can have them, you can have this be integer, you can have this be character, but the very main function in the program needs to be void main void. That's always, that's just the way the C programming language works. And then the body of the function goes here and then you close with the brace. Okay, so now we'll talk about data types and storage. The variables within a C program have four attributes. Name, by, name type, value, and storage location. For example, in the in the example program with variable counter is defined as being an unsigned character. So the name is counter and the type is unsigned character. And then the value was initialized as one. The, the C18 compiler will assign it an 8-bit memory location. So the compiler si signs the location. You don't have to worry about that. 
Although the name implies it must be a character, typically we use the word character to mean A, B, C, D, E, F, G, something like that. But in, in the C language, we, we can use it as a number as well, an 8-bit number. This is useful data type for many single byte variables that we're going to use in the PIC environment. We will later see that the port B and trist B are also defined as characters. If you look into that header file that we looked at before, you'll see that port B and trist B are defined as unsigned characters. Now if you look, you can look up on the internet to see the different data types, but you'll notice that a, a character in C is defined as a number between minus 128 and plus 127. That's a two's complement 8-bit number. An unsigned character is a number from 0 to 255, which is, is a, an 8-bit number. That's convenient because the PIC-18 processor is an 8-bit microprocessor. The one that we're using is 8-bit. So it can only handle uh, numbers from 0 to 255 anyway, since it's 8-bit. So that's convenient type of character for us to use now, if we had a, a very a larger processor, a 32-bit or a 16-bit, we may want to use an integer or floating or something like that. But um, in this type of processor, we've only got 8 bits, so it's not really a very math-intensive processor, in, in other words. So we're not probably going to be using these double floating points. This, this would be reserved for like a, a, a much larger uh, a data bus in your processor. <coughs> C operators. C recognizes a diverse set of operators, of which a few examples are shown in the next slide. If you have the book, you can look at table uh, appendix A 6.5. The symbols used are familiar, but their application is not always the same. For example, a single equals symbol is used to assign a variable to a variable. We looked at that before, tris, uh, tris b equals zero. But a double equal sign is used to represent the conventional equal to. Now this is the logical equal to when you're comparing things. So there's, there's a difference. Um, operators have a certain order of precedence shown in the table which indicates order operators are evaluated. So there's a certain precedence of order. Uh, and you can see that in the table. And so let's look at that really quick. So if you have a, several different operators in the same code, the, the, the precedence order is one. This means that the, uh, the, the quote, the um, parentheses here, they have the highest order of precedence, which is good. Anytime you put something in parentheses, you want that to be done in the order that you show. And then you can see that the add has a pretty high order of precedence. It's a four, um, but the greater than and equals has a lesser order of precedence that it has a six than the plus. So um, that kind of gives you the order so you'll know which what's going to be done first. Is the plus going to be done first or if you have an equals or greater than. So that kind of gives you something to go by. Also you have a multiply here. You see multiply has an order of three. Uh, and then you got the mod, you got the divide. So there, there's a lot, there's, there's a whole lot more than what you see here on the screen of operators. So these are the things that, that makes it really easy uh, to use the C language. You, you can just use a slash to divide a number or multiply. It makes it really a, a whole lot easier than uh, having to do all that manually. I also have some control of program flow and the words used, just some examples are break, case, continue, default, do, else, if, for, go to. You know, you can say if this condition, then do this condition, else, do this condition. Um, you have a return statement, a switch used for the case statements, and a while. We've already looked at the while statement. Let's look at that a little bit more. It's just one of the program flow statements. The while keyword allows a statement or block of statements to be executed repeatedly as long as a particular condition holds true. The general while structure is while, use the keyword while, and then you put the condition here, and then you put a statement. Um, th this will cause a statement to be executed. So this will be executed repeatedly as long as the conditional, this part of the expression, 
the conditional part. So the statement will be executed if the condition is met. Whatever you put in here. You can say x as long as x is greater than 2. Then you're going to set y equals to 1. Whatever you want to put in there, doesn't matter. Whatever you put in there, that's what's going to happen. So here is a continuous loop. Here a continuous loop is forced by putting a 1. If you now, one thing you have to realize is a 1 is always defined as true, mathematical expression. A 0 is, is always defined as being false. Okay? So that's what happens uh, from the computer standpoint. If, uh, if x is greater than 2, this gets assigned a value of 1 in the computer. If it's false, it gets assigned a value of 0. So ultimately, by setting a 1 here, 1 is always true, therefore uh, saying while 1, it's always going to be true. So this is always going to execute. So this is uh, in a real-time program where you're always wanting to read an analog to digital conversion, continuously wanting to do something, and you never want to stop doing that one thing, then this is a common technique used in the C language to uh, get a continuous loop. That's why this example is used, because it is very common. The C preprocessor. Now, the, the preprocessor, the idea of a preprocessor, it acts in a way very similar to similar directives. Now, you're going to have to read, look at some of the previous lessons I've done to understand what a similar directive is. But basically, these statements are passed directly to the compiler itself. So these commands are not a part of the assembly language or it's not part of the machine code of the processor. It's, it's actually a keyword that we're supplying to the computer software, which is the compiler, the MPLAB X compiler software. Um, and I think it'll be a little bit more clear as we go through this. But the format of the preprocessor directive requires that each directive occupies a line to itself the preprocessor directive is not terminated with a semicolon. Here's an example. The preprocessor statements always start with a pound. So pound, include, and then the name of the include file will include this include file which has all the, the things like trisb, trisa, all the special function register declarations inside of this header file which comes with the MPLABX software. So you don't have to spell out all of those uh, in your source code. So that's the advantage of having that. And this is, this is just one example of one preprocessor instruction. There are many others, actually. Um, actually, let me show, if I can find them really quick, I will show them to you. Oh, here's, here's a bunch of them. We've got a pound if, we've got a pound defined, Def define uh, a pound pragma which is used to set up the config registers and if else so there's these are all the preprocessor directives that you can use <clears throat> all right let's move on Okay, libraries. Because C is a simple language, much of its functionality derives from the standard functions and macros which are available in the libraries accompanying any compiler. A C library is a set of pre-compiled functions in the form of object files which can be linked to the application. The contents of the standard library are defined in the ANSI standard. It includes functions for input and output, a range of mathematical functions, for example, all trigonometric functions and other data handling functions. In addition to the standard library, a compiler may have its own library of functions intended specifically for its target environment. Now, we're going to move on. We've, we basically went through that entire example code. We described every aspect of it, hopefully. We're also going to, I'm going to show you how to simulate that in MPLAB X. I'll show you an actual example. Before I do, I want to go over a few more things. The advantages of working in C. 
It's faster programming. It's more reliable, less need to have intimate knowledge of the microcontroller hardware. You have standard libraries that you can use. Disadvantages of working with C. The program executes slightly slower than assembler equivalent. It takes more space and memory. Execution time cannot be predicted as precisely. A possible compromise is to write the body of the program in C and, and drop in assembler for those special situations where you need to have very fast code. For example, an analog digital conversion or something like that. Let's look at the C18 compiler. It's used as part of the MP lab in place of alongside the assembler. It supports non ANSI keywords. It has its own assembler. Now, one important thing which we need to know is this it, when you're using the assembler, so there's an assembler inside of the compiler. So when I use the word compiler, I'm talking about C only. When you use the word assembler, you're only talking about assembler. So we're mixing two different languages, but actually what we're trying to say is the compiler, which is a C compiler, will also assemble assembly language. So the C compiler is kind of like an assembler and a compiler. So you get two for one. You get your cake and eat it too. This must be contained, so you can, you can actually put an assembly language inside of your C code, but it must be within the words underscore ASM and end ASM the unders with the underscore. So that's kind of a nice feature of, of the assembler, of the compiler, I'm sorry. It has the processor specific include files and all special function registers, has special te techniques for locating and defining interrupt service routines, has special techniques for setting configuration words, uh, it does not com comply with strict ANSI C standards. So it's really, it's, des it's designed specifically uh, for microchip. So there may not be some, it may not be exact. Has a major set of library functions to interface with all peripherals. No more writing of awkward routines. So that's a nice feature as well. Has a major set of other standard library functions to undertake, undertake common actions like uh, data conversion or delays. So it's really nice to have a standard function of delays. <clears throat> the last slide here is just to really quickly to look at all the different files that we're going to be working with with MPLAB X. File structure. Header and library files are extensively used which with the result that hardly any C source files are standalone. Once the extra files are incorporated, the final executable program is built up from a number of contributing files, often in a quite complex way. In turn, the process of compiling a C program creates a range of output files. The process of compiling is illustrated below. You may have an assembler code, you may have C, you may have a header file, other header files, other library files. The compiler compiles those, the assembler assembler assembles those into two object files. Then you have a linker that links that with your library files. Sorry, I said over here you had libraries. Actually, your library files are here. And then you may have a linker script. This is a lot of files. <laughs> Most of these files are contained within MPLAB X, except for, of course, your C code and your uh, assembler code. These are the ones you have to write. Everything else you can get from MPLAB X. The linker links them all together and gives you one executable file which you can execute. The hex is what you can download to your chip. You get a listing file, a map file, and a debug file as well. Okay, so now that we went through the slides, let's quickly go over an example program using MPLAB X. So I got the program open here. The way you can do, if you look at the previous lessons, of course, the way you start is you go to new project, you go standalone project, um, and then you hit next, and then you go to the processor that you want, pick 18F242, that's the one we're going to use. Go next. Now you pick your hardware tools. If you have a pick kit two or three, you can use that, or you can use a simulator. I'm going to use a simulator. And then you pick. If you have the this the C compiler, you need to have a C compiler installed. 
having MPLabX doesn't mean you have a C compiler. You actually have to go download this separately from the website. So, um, one way, so you, one way you can tell if you have it, it needs to be shown up right here. So you can click on it. Okay. Now, well, another way to tell that you've had it, you, you can go to your start menu, go to all programs, go to microchip. It should be under here, under your menu. I did have one student that said, you know, he had to re, re once you install it, you install it from the website. Let's go to the website really quick. Okay, let's go to Google. Okay. XC8. Let's type XC8. Um, compilers. XC8. Yeah. There you go. You can download that from there, or you can just type MPLAB X. MPLAB X. See, there you go, right there. MPLAB X. If you go there, then if you click download MPLAB X, you can see right below here, you can see there's the XC8 compiler, XC16, 32, X, the C18 light compiler. Um, you can try the 16.8 light compiler. I'm using this, the XC8 compiler. I think that was the one that was suggested to me when I downloaded. So, um, if you want to try the C18, that's fine. I think this, I think this one is the the one that's recommended. So, that's what I'm using. So once you got that program, then uh, you can download the file from the website that I gave you, um, which is on my Dropbox website right here. The file, set that location paste it in here. Now one thing I, I typed this out from the book actually because the support website did not have it on there uh, from the author. But I typed out these the Pragma instructions. These are pre-processor uh, pre instructions. Um, also it had some include standard I.O. standard live and then a pick 18F include. And then notice here that um, the Pragma, I, I, had, I typed these in actually, they work just fine. You can see my configuration bits have been set properly. Um, but how did I know how to type these in properly? Well, I did a little bit of research on the internet and uh, also downloaded this document. This document is called the PIC18 Configuration Settings Addendum, which you can Google and get off the PIC Microchips website. And then you can go down the bookmarks and you can click the chip that you have and it tells you what all oscillator settings you have. And then you can just type these in. This gives you the, the command, uh, for example, w, watchdog timer WDT equals off. So I just, I type that in, you know, WDT equals off and then comma. And you can type as many of those as you want and just have at it. Also notice that the PIC 18F2420 is in here as well, but notice they're different. These files are different. So the configuration settings on the 242 and the 2420 are different. Even though the, they're very similar architecture chips, they're, they're slightly different. Okay, so <clears throat> anyway, I, st I set up a watch window on here I uh, after I did my pragma statements to get the configuration the watchdog timer off I have the unsigned character um, and then I have my void main void statement my, I'm initializing tris B to all outputs counter equals in, initializing counter to one got my while statement and then I'm just incrementing a counter I'm outputting the counter to port B and then I'm incrementing the counter. So let's see if we can simulate this program. So let's com let's compile it. And then let's run it. We click this button. Now it's running. 
we need to pause it and it's going to be at a random location then we can reset it now we can go to the watch window here and we can single step through it I just notice Tris B went to zero and counter should go to one so there's counter should go to value of one it did now counter should go to port B actually this Let's look at port B, this new watch. Let's go to port B over here. Let's see here. Port, there's port, uh, port B. Let's add port B. There's port B. So it went to a 1. And then counter goes to counter plus 1. You can see counter just went to value of 2. And now port B went to, uh, let's see here, 2. Yeah. Now counter goes to three. Port B goes to three. Counter goes to four. Port B goes to four. Counter goes to five. Port B goes to five. Counter goes to six. Port B goes to six. Now in a real program, you'd have to put a delay in here. We we'll talk about how to do a delay later. Um, there's there's predefined functions if then C to do a delay. Um, but for now, that's it. So hopefully you enjoyed this lesson, uh, introduction to C, and using the PIC-18 uh, microchip processors. Thank you, and we'll see you for the next lesson.